So welcome, and thank you all for coming to the panel, Feminist Encounters with Wikipedia. So you may have read this description. Uh, this panel will address the systemic gaps in participation in editing Wikipedia, where the known statistic is that 87% of Wikipedia editors are male. This is from a study some years ago. We'll talk about that statistic a bit, I think, tonight. But unsurprisingly, consistent underrepresentation is also reflected in the content, not just in the quantitative numbers, uh, and coverage throughout the significant digital cultural archive of Wikipedia. Recent feminist initiatives have garnered much coverage and attention in, in covering these proven biases, but uh, results of these efforts have built significant entry points, though they have done that, for engaging Wikipedia practically and critically. In addition to reporting on the quantitative aspects of this, these successes, tonight we hope to explore potentially unexpected questions about digital labor, intersectionality, and sustainability that emerge in designing feminist encounters with Wikipedia. And you know, I think that Wikipedia itself has thought a lot about these issues, so to think about them specifically in relation to these in initiatives is what we're after. So with that, I want to introduce our first panelist. Uh, I'm sitting here in the front row. Um, Anne Balsamo serves as the Dean of the School of Media Studies at the New School here at the, at the New School for Public Engagement uh, in New York City, the sponsor of tonight's panel. And uh, she's the author of Technologies of the Gendered Body, Reading Cyborg Women from 1995, and more recently, Designing Culture, the Technological Imagination at Work from 2011, both published by Duke University Press. She's also a co-founder of FemTechNet, uh, along with Alex Juhas in Pitzer College. And the, this is FemTechNet you'll hear a bit about tonight, and especially in uh, Dean Balsamo's presentation, is an activated feminist technology network of scholars, artists, and students, and she'll talk more about it now. Uh, join me in welcoming our brave first panelist, Anne Balsamo. <laughs> Wow, this is a really good turnout. Way to go, Leanna. <laughs> Thanks for tweeting and um, everyone who publicized um, the event. Um, and I'm delighted, I'm really delighted that um, the other panelists are here. Thank you for being here. We had an idea. I think it was in discussion with, uh, with Marcea about her, um, her thesis. And we said, let's do a panel on it. And it ha happened to be a time that Antoinette was going to be in town. So this was very fortuitous. Uh, I am um, going to take the, the time to kind of set the stage for my engagement with Wikipedia projects that really came out of a pedagogical experiment that I've been um, working on with a group of colleagues that, uh, and this group is called FemTechNet, and as, <clears throat> as uh, Veronica mentioned, FemTechNet is an activated network of scholars, activists, uh, artists, researchers, and community organizers who all kind of work on the kind of the intersections of feminism, science, and technology. This group was formed in 2012 um, in part so that we would start being able to network among ourselves across institutions, across um, global locations and across disciplines because many of us who have been doing um, work on feminism and technology, I, I've been working on that for um, well over two decades, um, often find ourselves um, isolated in our institutions. We're one or two kind of feminists working specifically on technology and we believed that the time had come for us to, again, it wasn't to form a network but to activate the network that was already there. So one of the first th projects that FemTechNet took on was um, thinking about kind of our pedagogical practices and how we might kind of through the activation of this network of people who are interested in feminism and technology, um, how we might kind of address the underrepresentation of feminism and technology topics in various curricula. So it was also the time we got started in um, early 2012, which was, if you remember, uh, just a couple months after the first MOOCs were kind of highly publicized and exploded into the popular imagination. So one of the things that we um, converged on was a kind of early critique of the um, 
the pedagogical aims of MOOCs and the pedagogical kind of, uh, uh, kind of foundations. We were really wondering what the underlying kind of learning philosophy is as MOOC and taking some issue with it from a feminist perspective. So based on work I had been doing in my book called Designing Culture, um, you know, I made the argument that there were a couple things we could do. We could critique MOOCs, write white papers and essays and so on, or we might take on a more ambitious project or a parallel project of doing the critique in one form, but a parallel project which was to design something differently. So that's what we did. So an early kind of group, about three dozen feminists, um, got together and we did you know, what was a kind of startup project to create a, an alternative genre of MOOC, we call it a doc, and it is framed as a feminist cyber learning experiment. A doc differs from a MOOC in specific ways. A doc is, distri is a distributed open collaborative <coughs> course in contrast to the massively open online course that is a MOOC. A MOOC, and this is a very kind of um, you know, pointed uh, infographic. A MOOC, <laughs> a MOOC usually starts with um, content that is produced at a brand name university, and it is um, the kind of role of the university to deliver its precious content to the uninformed masses who all kind of plug in, kind of in isolated um, kind of uh, locations, distributed as it may be around the globe. But there, are, there is a sense that the aim is to reach the masses with the kind of grand insights of the, of the centralized university. Um, in contrast, a doc really works on the network kind of, um, kind of, uh, kind of logic. And there is a shared kind of central node to a doc, but it is a commons where people kind of plug into the commons. And I'll talk a little bit about how this is, um, kind of how this uh, was uh, kind of organized. Um, our docs have nodal courses. So the doc is a consortium of courses that are taught in institutions, mostly throughout the United States. We ran the first doc in 2013 from September through December. It was called Dialogues in Feminism and Technology. And it involved, as you can see, um, about 27 instructors, 200 students, uh, about 25 drop-in learners or self-directed learners. Uh, we had this kind of shared public-facing learning materials that we called video dialogues. Um, just in th that kind of 15 weeks, there were more than 3,000 um, views of, these, of our shared materials. Um, students produced keyword videos, so there were about two dozen of those. And one of the things, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, um, just by the end of those 15 weeks, we could document uh, at least a thousand Wikipedia edits that people had made throughout this. And probably the thing that um, we're the most proud of, but this is because we're a different kind of MOOC, right? We're not reaching the masses. We are um, trying to work on creating a critical mass of learners. Um, we had a 99% completion rate, which means most of the students, I think we had one student drop out, and I'm sorry to say that that student was a new school student in my course. <laughs> so if anybody fell down on the job, it was me. Um, the doc is, um, and can, we're in now our fourth season of running the doc, um, sponsored by FemTechNet. Um, it had been wildly interdisciplinary, across disciplinary, across uh, library information sciences and various humanities programs. Um, and the way in which nodal courses were organized is that each instructor who wanted to teach a nodal course taught a course that made sense within the curriculum that they were already teaching. So we didn't have a singular syllabus. Rather, what we had were 15 modules based on different topics that people could plug in as it made sense. Here's a list of the institutions that were um, uh, kind of involved, and you'll see it ranges from you know, small liberal arts universities, um, the, the genre of university that is the new school. I don't know what it is <laughs> entirely. It's a university genre unto itself. Um, you know, some of the big name universities like Brown and Yale. And one of the things that was really interesting for us is that we had two startup groups kind of convene themselves by community organizers. One group that met in San Antonio, not San Antonio, 
and the other one that met in Massachusetts. So two groups that followed along for the 15 weeks that met in local libraries um, and uh, coffee shops. So 18 nodal sites, and this is pretty typical for how the docks run um, in the fall. Springs, we, spring terms, we usually have fewer participants. So just in um, kind of overview, again, our aim was to create a critical mass. You know, there will never be a day, although I would love to see this day, when there will be 10,000 people at one time signing up for a MOOC in feminism and technology. <laughs> Talk about being a pragmatist. <laughs> You know, we just wanted to reach those who are already distributed across the globe, and 200 at one time in synchronicity for one semester, that's more than I could ever get, even at a place like the New School. So in part, you know, our aim was, was much more modest than a MOOC, which is why we could also have a lot more um, collaboration, a lot more contact. Um, open versus scripted, this is the notion that the site-specific courses were embedded in particular curricula, that we didn't kind of, do, kind of demand a uh, singular um, syllabus. Collaborative versus online, um, it was, it, the, the courses were um, kind of incorporated technologies and there was an online component, um, but for the most part, it was a very kind of set of collaborative um, ex exercises where people worked kind of course to course to have their students uh, kind, of, kind of work in, um, uh, in complementary ways or in collaboration. And again, we didn't, um, we didn't constitute it as a standalone course run through like Blackboard or Canvas or so on. Rather, we opted for a commons that we built ourselves that wasn't kind of branded in any way. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a Coursera offering or so on. That created some problems as well as opportunities, but it gave us a lot of freedom in terms of what to teach and how to manage and deal with our materials. The basic components, and this is where I'll get into the, uh, the way in which we had dealt with um, and incorporated Wikipedia exercises. The basic components of the uh, course included a public-facing 15 weeks series of what we called video dialogues, which featured two feminist scholars in dialogue with one another, demonstrating and actually enacting the kind of feminist understanding of how knowledge is created in dialogue across differences. So 15 dialogues done on different topics, on sexuality, race, uh, systems, uh, narrative, infrastructures, archive, things like that. Keyword videos, that was one of the making exercises that many instructors um, incorporated into their, um, into their individual syllabi. And then one of the shared activities that we asked everybody to participate in, at least for that first season, was something that we called the wiki storming. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, and I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna take responsibility for the term, and, um, and understand that not everybody enjoyed the term wiki storming because they thought in some respects it was a bit aggressive. And um, I will, I, again, I will take responsibility for it for a number of reasons. One is, is that I've been trying to teach um, Wikipedia editing in my classes and especially to young women in my feminism and, and technology classes. Um, for as long as Wikipedia has been up and running and I've never been able to get any traction on it. And so there was a sense in which I felt like I had to amp up the rhetoric, that we had to make something be at stake, that there was some sort of call to, you know, call to action. So the rhetoric here was intentional and actually not meant to be as aggressive as it comes off, but it was meant not so much to those who were kind of Wikipedians and so on, but to those who were yet to be called to kind of want to get involved. So there was, you know, trying to address the kind of activist social justice kind of impulse of my students or kind of sensibility about that they have. There was another reason, um, and one reason, and this is something that I've been uh, kind of working on in different kind of perspectives for a long time. Again, I'm a, now a second generation uh, feminist scholar taught by the first generation of feminist scholars who really took on the project of dealing with topics of feminism and technology. And uh, much of the work that I 
studied when I was in graduate school, things that I was taught, things that I worked on very in my early research and so on, much of that feminist work is not at all to be found in Wikipedia. And there's a book in particular that is an incredible resource that was a gift to the feminist scholarly community by a woman named Autumn Stanley. It's called Mothers and Daughters of Invention. It's a 750-page book, and it documents more than 4,000 names of women and feminists who have made contributions to five different domains of history of technology. And it's called Mothers and Daughters of Invention's Notes for a Revised History of Technology. Mm -hmm. And I have an exercise that I do with my students, and I've done this before Wikipedia, after Wikipedia, which is I give them a book and I say, open it to any page and go find me something about that woman. And you can't use Adam St Autumn Stanley's book. <laughs> and so it's a, it's, a, it's a teachable exercise. And of course, what usually happens is that the students come back and they can find nothing. But what I ask them to do is to document their process of whereby they went to try to find something. So go to the notable women in art and history. Go to the notable scientists, American scientists. Go to the encyclopedias and tell me where you would have expected to find her and document where she isn't. Because finding lost women, of course, is a really difficult process. So that project and longstanding um, pedagogical activity for me matched up really well with the Wikipedia um, kind of editing exercise. At the same time, many other uh, Feminist groups were getting together, so we were also kind of coming, kind of coming of age, in terms of our FemTechNet efforts with other um, feminist projects, including the Wikipedia Feminism Project, as well as the um, the hashtag Too Few project. So you know, I'm just going to kind of mention a couple things about, and then I'm going to turn it over. Um, very shortly after we launched the course, with kind of wiki storming on the agenda, we barely even got started. I think we had run our first kind of Wikipedia editing um, session in our class. Um, the, the project got picked up by Fox <coughs> News. And it was, and I'm not going to show this, but it's still online. There's, uh, so Fox, you know, of course, exploded it and talked to talked out, to, you know, out both sides of their mouth. You know, Wikipedia is supposed to be neutral, but don't we know Wikipedia is biased? I mean, they were, you know, they just, you know, didn't even get the story right. But this young woman, um, Catherine Timp, reported on it, and this was the, you know, colleges offer credit to inject feminism into Wikipedia. The, um, the URL says um, colleges inject bias into Wikipedia. So, I mean, it was clearly not Fox's, uh, you know, thing. And, you know, she, um, she, she does some very kind of unfortunate things in her reporting, including saying things like, and I'll have to read this, Tim says, in 1857, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telegram. What, a woman would have done it, but she was in the, in the kitchen making dinner. And then one of, we didn't even have to point this out, because one of the comments came, well, how about learning some history before believing you're qualified to edit it? Bell would have been 10 years old in 1857, and the telegram is a note, not a machine, and it was invented by Samuel Morse. Um, anyway, so she makes fun of us doing it, and then in doing that demonstrates exactly what we're trying to get at, which is, you know, can you at least get your history of technology right, regardless of whether or not women have anything to do with it? But, you know, so that was some of the comments. Um, and then here's another one. I have one. The closest a woman should ever be allowed to get to a business is to shop at it. You know, so it was a very teachable moment in the sense that although we were very kind of um, uneasy about the attention from Fox, it also demonstrated for the students in most of our classes that there's something at stake here. People don't want us taking on these kind of difficult topics and that the, that the, um, the kind of widespread ignorance about women you know, contribution to the histories of technology is, is pretty blatant and, and um, you know, and, and being reproduced, actively reproduced. Some of the, um, the kind of noteworthy uh, contributions <coughs> that were produced in just my class and um, in the context, and I should say it wasn't just my class because Veronica and I co-taught it, but uh, for example, one of the students um, kind of created an entire page on um, heresies, the feminist publication of art and politics, 
which hadn't had a, a Wikipedia page at all. Another uh, student worked on a page on just decriminalizing sex work. Um, a feminist dictionary, this again, major kind of contribution um, to histories of women and language, didn't have a Wikipedia page, and although it was, you know, it has been a kind of major um, impactful kind of feminist work. And then different single, um, kind of single pages on noteworthy women. So in the process of um, doing the Wikistorming activities, uh, we created a number of um, resources for uh, other instructors, FemTechNet instructors, so that they would learn kind of how to teach with Wikipedia. And in that, um, in that case, I want to give a shout out to a very special person who was with us from the beginning. Um, Adrian Wadowitz it is a very kind of well, kind of was very well established Wikipedian. She was with us from the very beginning. She was the one who trained the trainers. She trained us at our summer workshop before we even started the doc. Um, she died um, in an unfortunate accident in uh, April 20, it's already been a year now. It's April, last April. Um, she was, uh, I mean, she was with us every step of the way. She did workshops, she was with us in our you know, in our first, um, our kind of first season. And, uh, you know, she brought us, she did what is really important with Wikipedia, which is she brought a, a whole group of newbies into the Wikipedia culture. She showed us where to go, how to register our projects, how to make sense of the pillars, how to understand, you know, how to read the discourse and the different pages and so on. So we were shepherded um, in our early efforts which is why I think also we did not have a lot of problems with our Wikipedia edits. You know, for the most part, it, we don't have any record of edit wars <laughs> going on or things that were um, put up by students that immediately got taken down. And I really attribute that to the fact that, um, that Adrian not only kind of guided us in how one participates meaningfully in the Wikipedia culture, but um, she also went to bat for us when people did come up or other editors um, may have come up with contestation and so on. So I want to say thank you um, for the opportunity to both get a chance to just talk a little bit about FemTechNet and the context, and I'm really looking forward to the other presentations. Thank you. Also, some other good news. The live stream is now working, mm -hmm. so that's happening. Um, our next presenter is Marcia Decker. <laughs> uh, Marcia Decker is a master's candidate in Parsons, the new school for designs, master's design in urban e ecologies program. She is a multidisciplinary designer with a background in geography and GIS as well as a Wikipedian actively involved in edit-a-thons and meetups as co-chair of the FemTechNet uh, Wikipedia Committee, newly reinstituted. Her thesis work titled Mind the Gap, Exposing Algorithmic Exclusion, examines subtle infrastructures of power and politics in digital space. And she's got a really nice presentation for us tonight <laughs> from NeoCities. So please welcome Marcia. Hi. I just want to say thank you for everyone who's here, and um, I'm so honored to be speaking here with a lot of uh, really, really inspiring feminist thinkers. Um, so I'm Marcia. I'm a master's candidate here at Parsons New School for Design. Um, my thesis, I actually use Twine, which is an open source, um, nonlinear storytelling game uh, format, and I was playing around with trying to make it into a presentation, so bear with me, it's a little experimental, but I thought it might be fitting for tonight. So, so a theme that has been really prominent in my research in understanding, um, is understanding hidden infrastructures that marginalize the voices of the other, especially in digital space, where familiar reproductions of power structures that exclude many voices in urban society also define who is represented in the digital. Digital space is not a utopia free from the politics of identity, body, race, or gender. The infrastructure in both physical and digital spaces is designed to be ignored. Though the outward face projects a message of ethos and transparency, democracy, 
open and public, public platforms, Behind the mask is a mess of commercialization, privatization, safety concerns, harassment, and inequality. And as Dean Balsamo has written about before, there are readily observable social and cultural consequences, such as new languages, new body-based habits, way of knowing, narratives and myths, agency. And we have to ask, for whom are these conditions created? The lack of critically distinguishing open from equal allows for inequality to continue to operate behind the mask. And it is incredibly important for feminists to be engaged in the dialogue and being a part of shaping a future that, frankly, doesn't suck. So. <laughs> a concrete example of this inequality that I have been engaging deeply within my research and relevant to the topic of this panel and the urgency of it is Wikipedia and its gender systemic bias, where, as we've heard before, 87 to 90% of the editors are male. A lot of people are very surprised when they hear this statistic for the first time, in part, I think, because of the new myth that an open platform cannot also exhibit glaring inequalities that impact its content. And the impacts are seemingly obvious, yet covert. And sometimes it feels hard to question that as the underrepresented voice. And the inequalities continue to thrive even after explicitly recognizing that the gender bi bias exists and affects the content of Wikipedia, which Wikipedia itself has noted as a prevalent issue for it um, in its early beginnings. Again, influenced by Dean Balsamo and her work, Technologies of, of the Gendered Body, there is a big fixation on the simple count of female bodies in space as markers of success of achieving diversity in technology. Focusing on getting more women into contact with technology embeds the assumption that women have not already been there historically and are not currently navigating all of the layered politics involved in staying in technology. Anyone attempting to ask why women are not present must be prepared to hear a myriad of different responses, layered factors, contradictions, incongruencies, as well as a distinct pattern of a larger systemic marginalization. That messy reality is incredibly important. When engaging with issues of pervasive systemic gender bias, feminists can build on the wealth of knowledge from feminist theory, activism, and history, and contribute a much deeper understanding of the factors at play than a simple body count of who is present could ever represent. Because the presence is not really what is going to change the technologies and the culture of technology. And it is no guarantee that there is something inherent to women that their participation will really shift these exclusionary environments. It takes exposing those hidden infrastructures that so subtly reproduce these inequalities through discussion and dialogue and engagement in supportive and respectful safe environments that begin to make that shift. In reference to Wikipedia in particular, how Wikipedia currently negotiates and resolves conflict around the creation and editing of content is particularly interesting to unpack. I'd like to take a few minutes to go through some of Wikipedia's five pillars, supplementing my own views with the work of Adrian Wadowitz, detailing how and why some of them in practice act as significant barriers rather than mechanisms for quality control. So I'm gonna talk about the second pillar um, that Wikipedia has written from a neutral point of view, striving for <coughs> verifiable accuracy and reliable sources. Who writes Wikipedia is important in how information is presented on the site. Though Wikipedia has an outspoken commitment to verifiable facts, there are also many other unwritten rules in how the site functions that largely dictates how information is presented. Though edits, flagging of articles, and so on are discussed transparently in the talk pages, it's important to note that the guidelines aiming to promote neutrality on the site are easily subverted to reinforce patriarchal narratives of power. Flagging articles for speedy deletion and or for no indication of importance or notability is a practice that in theory should monitor spam articles, but rather seem to police whether a woman is notable enough to have her own article on Wikipedia. Verifiability, not truth, is a common mantra on Wikipedia. However, this is problematic since the mechanisms for verifiability and valid sources rely on and mirror the dominant patriarchal system of credibility, notability, and legitimacy of information. And even when editors only cite published sources, interpretation is inevitable. And that individual interpretation can drastically change how the information is presented. Only one perspective can be illustrated. So what gets chosen? Who is represented? 
The fourth pillar of Wikipedia promotes respect and civility between editors. Though due to Wikipedia's culture of sexism, this does not always operate effectively in practice. It is clear that editors have a distinct perspective and opinion, and this absolutely impacts the ways in which the, the encyclopedia is edited and how information is presented. Without firm anti-harassment protocols or official channels to report harassment save for emergency threats of violence, how is this pillar put into practice? Um, I know that this is something Dorothy Howard has written about and is doing work around, which is incredibly important not only for Wikipedia, but I think as we've seen on many other digital platforms as well. The last pillar is that Wikipedia does not have firm rules, though it has guidelines and policies. This allows for the Wikipedia to be responsive, up to date, and progressive, especially as it has in the past reflected political positions, such as in its protests against SOPA and PIPA. Why not progressively and purposefully challenge Wikipedia as a platform to defy patriarchal re reproduction as well? I think in asking these questions, it's important to acknowledge that every choice Wikipedia editors make is not neutral and inherently political, since Wikipedia is shaping the world's knowledge, placing those who are editing in a great position of power and importance. It's time to raise critical questions for its future. And being involved with Wikipedia edit-a-thons <coughs> and meetups as Wikipedia co-chair in FemTechNet has been not only a network and pathways to raise those critical questions, but also as an exercise in community action, sharing as well as producing knowledge collaboratively for a larger shared knowledge platform. Editing within a feminist network shifts engagement from passive to active. Edit-a-thons, while seemingly small, are vital in salvaging Wikipedia's potential for inclusivity. It is a tool to claim some power to challenge, disrupt, and actively change what is flawed in the structure. Editathons, in particular, are becoming ener energetic, exciting, and productive in the content of social interaction, with editors ranging from beginner to expert. The outcomes of the events are quite literally writing women and their contributions back into history. The outcomes. Um, provide the outcomes and the events provide networks of support as well as an entry point into technical and computing environments where simultane while simultaneously critically discussing and shifting the inherent sexist infrastructure of digital space. And as a scholar and practitioner in urban design, it's especially heartening for me to be a part of what I see as an actually attended, super fun and engaging community meeting. All right, thanks again. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. Okay, now we have to take away the twine. Um, yeah, I was going to let you, do you want me to show it, screen it before you take the stage? Okay. So I was going to, okay, and then you can play it? Okay. So. Dorothy Howard will introduce the video, and I will introduce Dorothy Howard. Dorothy Howard uh, recently served as Wikipedian in residence at the Metropolitan New York Library Council, Council, where she gave Wikipedia editing trainings and lectures on Wikipedia to <laughs> libraries and archives in the New York metropolitan area and in the eastern United States. She has also been a co-organizer co of the Global Art and Feminism Wikipedia Editathons, which we'll hear about more about tonight, and uh, other initiatives, uh, Wikip Wikimedia LGBT campaigns and a conference organizer for Wiki Conference USA. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Dorothy Howard. Thank you Veronica, thank you Anne and everyone else for coming out tonight. Um, so I'm taking, so tomorrow is my last official day as Wikipedian in residence at the oh. Metropolitan New York Library Council. And I'm taking um, the mantra critical mass to heart and making this presentation a little more critical than I've been able to um, as sort of the local evangelical <laughs> Wikipedian um, to New York libraries. So um, this will feel a little experimental to me, but thank you um, for embracing that. I'm going to show the first two minutes of this great little documentary made by um, the Wikimedia Foundation storyteller about the recent art and feminism um, edit-a-thons we did 
on March 7th, and this one is, uh, actually, I'm talking at the beginning, so you get to hear me on video, too. Welcome to the second annual Art and Feminism Wikipedia Editathon at the Museum of Modern Art. In 2010, there was a study that found that around 8.5% of Wikipedia editors were women. Other studies have shown that it's somewhere between 8 and 16%, um, so the numbers are quite low as far as female editors go. There's a lack of history in feminist art, in women artists, and in topics about gender and gender expression on Wikipedia. And we'd like to change that, so that's what we're working on today. Yeah, I mean, blogs are difficult. I'm here to help correct some of the gender imbalances among not only the articles that are presented in Wikipedia, but among the editors that are included in the effort. Uh, I am a professional writer and editor. I'm also a feminist, and I love art. So as soon as I heard about this, I knew it was something that I wanted to participate on, not only as an expert, but as a passionate supporter of the campaign. I have been talking about um, hip hop tourism here in New York City and how it evolved and where it started and you know who's part who are part of the legends and the historical icons in a place um, that's so relevant to the movement of hip hop. I think um, you know the social platform, the internet. There's so many things that are out there that I really don't know about, and I wanted to be able to learn how to use it the best way, the best practices, and you know maybe cut some hours of just trying to figure things out on my own. When you come to events like this, they tell you the shortcuts and they kind of explain it to you the right way. From a long time, I wanted to edit it, Wikipedia articles. It's kind of a long video, but it's on YouTube. Um, Art and feminism, Wikipedia. I think it's the first one. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background. Um, my experience with Wikipedia has been mainly as an organizer. I started editing Wikipedia about a year before I became Wikipedia in, in residence. So a lot of the learning um, took place uh, on the job for me. Um, uh, so I've been Wikipedia in residence at the Metropolitan New York Library Council for about a year and a half. And that's involved. Um, working with libraries and archives on a strategy for putting their collections on Wikipedia. And it's usually started small scale, so um, writing a few articles and then perhaps um, hosting an event or doing more. But beyond that, uh, so we've, we've hosted around 15 edit-a-thons at um, institutions like the Guggenheim and the Center for Jewish <coughs> History here in New York. Um, but I've also been part of some more global initiatives, that, uh, including the Wikipedia LGBT project. Um, that project started out of a need for solidarity and support among LGBT editors, partially because in uh, countries where LGBT topics are not um, politically recognized, um, editing Wikipedia can be uh, serious, can have physical uh, risk involved or uh, social risk. And so globally, uh, Wikipedia editors need support on, these t uh, uh, on how to remain anonymous and edit these topics um, or, or on the kinds of um, social issues that they can't talk about within their chapters. Um, I've also been involved uh, in the uh, art and feminism edit-a-thons that you see here. Um, this year we had about 70 events, so it was uh, globally, um, all the way from Russia to Australia to Amsterdam um, to 10 events actually in California. So we, it, was a, it was practice in, in coordinating um, sort of a global nodal campaign, and I have, some, I have some takeaways from all these projects that I'll be going over later, um, especially this one. Um, and a project that I'm Probably the most proud of is um, the Black Lives Matter edit-a-thons that we got to work on at the Schoenberg Center for Research of Black uh, Culture um, that, um, and that included um, editing topics on black history and the African diaspora. Um, this has been particularly of interest to me um, 
because I like to think about Wikipedia as a tool for activists and activism. Um, that I, I, I gravitate towards articles on current events as an editor and um, sort of follow, following the article for Michael Brown for in, I, uh, the sh so the Michael Brown shooting actually happened on August 9th. Women's, black women's lives matter too. It's interesting that you're, you're for that. You know, they don't say anything about black women. Black women get shot by the cops. Yeah, it's, it's Black girls aren't protected in school. You know, and it's interesting that people take on these projects and talk all of that, but where's the system? You take the black man before the black woman, you need to look at that. That's a and really good point. System. Thank you for that comment. We can definitely talk more to during the q and I just wanted to let you know, because I'm like Thank you. Um, so on August 9th, Michael Brown was shot, and uh, by August 11th, there were uh, over 5,000 edits to the page with 523 editors. <laughs> Um, so this was actually the site where a lot of the conversations about the, the case itself were happening and the details um, down to the second were being recorded. Um, 90 days after the shooting, uh, there were over 2 million views to this Wikipedia article and it was the top source of consulted information on this um, event. So Wikipedia, I, I like to consider Wikipedia a battleground for current events. Um, especially when we're, we're talking about um, you know, uh, topics in, in race and gender. Um, and um, I've, also, I've also been actively writing articles of that, uh, about controversial sort of current event topics. I wrote the article for Cecily McMillan, an uh, Occupy Wall Street protester, and I was really interested. Um, I asked uh, one of my friends who was an Occupy protester uh, for an image because he knew her personally and I put it on the I put it on the Wikipedia article and the next day the Wall Street it was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal um, however the next day um, the article was flagged for notability and went into an article for a deletion debate um, <laughs> where uh, I was uh, subsequently accused for posting on Twitter about this um, sort of circumstance so I was accused of meat puppeting and almost got some of my feminist Wikipedia f editor friends' um, accounts deleted. So it was a art articles for deletion um, and the nobil uh, notability debates that um, Marseille was talking about are especially prevalent um, to current events and feminist topics. Um, so those, those are the main areas that I've been working in the past about two years. Um, I'm um, so from from all these experiences. One thing that I've observed is uh, uh, that's not often talked about by the Wikipedia community is harassment on Wikipedia. Um, partially because it's a tough subject to breach. Uh, we all love Wikipedia. It's uh, it offers an incredible global community. Um, however, there are a variety of um, types of harassment both on Wikipedia and offline events that happen and in my opinion are a reason why women uh, have a high barrier for entry um, both on and off uh, on Wikipedia and in events. Um, so on Wikipedia the common types of harassment include um, trolling and stalking, um, toxic masculinity, uh, or blatant masculinity, um, sexism. So when I say blatant, I mean um, people, the kinds of the kinds of posts that Anne was talking about, um, blatant sexism, but also emasculation. Like the kind of posts that you put up. Um, silencing. So the kinds of you, uh, and these all of these sort of things I'm naming occur in in sort of uh, in talk pages and in debates like article for deletion debate. So silencing, saying things like not all men. Um, there's also immediate threats of harm. Um, and uh, both in in person and on Wikipedia, um, there's othering, so gender, racial, cultural insensitivities, pronoun use, essentialism, transphobia, ostracism, invisibility, lack of representation, con, dis, con uh, dis, 
de densation, no, <laughs> condensation, um, splaining, white knighting, shaming, and slut shaming. And uh, the reason I wanted to sort of bring that list to bear partially is because it's uh, uh, emotionally, uh, there's a lot of affective labor that goes into being a female editor of Wikipedia. And that's <coughs> one of the ways that I've found solidarity among fellow uh, women editors is uh, just directly talking about these things. Um, but it's also these, the, all of these types of harassment have made it somewhat difficult to, to actively ask people to edit Wikipedia and to ask it to be taught in classrooms. I've talked to professors who you know, felt a little worried about exposing their students to this type of environment. And my explanation has always been, you know, they're, they're going, people are encountering this stuff online in one way or another. They sh you shouldn't be, a, and it's often a learning experience to have it happen. Um, however, it's, 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 uh, it's, I call it affective labor um, because I think that um, uh, I think that women have a there's uh, there's many reasons why uh, women engage less in Wikipedia, but often it's because of the emotional burden that it takes to engage in these types of debates. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so my my next sort of criticism of Wikipedia. <laughs> of this nature is that um, volunteers, so volunteers are part of um, global community and sort of help each other um, in editing and other sorts, in understanding Wikipedia's policies. However, um, volunteers are also forced to handle their own complaints for harassment. So Wikipedia has, has um, a, a process for uh, people, uh, for people um, reporting th immediate threats of harm, such as like suicide and death threats. But other than that, um, the Wikimedia Foundation has no sort of formal structure for mediation. And you can send an email to like the, the OTRS, the Wikipedia email, or ask other editors to help you out. And there is a growing number of feminist editors. However, because there is no process for reporting this, type of stuff, um, it's often left to the, to the, it's often left to the work of administrators, which is one of the most male uh, sort of populations within Wikipedia, um, and to the, the higher courts of Wikipedia, which are even more male. Um, so ask it, in my opinion, asking volunteers to self-mediate this type of stuff is one of the reasons why Wikipedia has had such difficulty retaining female editors. Um, and um, so I, I like to use the metaphor that um, actually an artist named Park MacArthur um, brought up, uh, or Park MacArthur and Mia Mingus brought up in a recent talk at the New Museum. So they were talking about uh, accessibility. Uh, in the con it was in the context of um, D disability, but could be viewed more widely. So uh, accessibility as an act of love and solidarity and intimacy. And so I'd like to sort of, I, I, I really, I was re very fond of this way of thinking about um, accessibility as it applies to the usability of uh, websites, and especially uh, websites and, and, and how websites can maybe think about providing uh, better services or better processes for reporting harassment as a form of um, a, a value of showing value for their volunteer communities. Um, I also see uh, volunteering as um, so. I've been thinking a lot about the history of volunteering as it applies to the, the internet, and. Um, I think that there's something to be said for conceiving of volunteering as labor in the fact uh, by thinking about uh, the way that Wikipedia editors um, create value for Wikipedia, for each other, for the internet, for the glo for global citizens, um, and that uh, I think it's 
part of considering volunteering as labor is, uh, re is uh, recognizing that volunteers deserve a level of um, a HR, a level of uh, human resources, the type that a volunteer for the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim, might get uh, when they walk in the door, a, a sense of security for engaging in that institution. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in, I, would, I would say that one of the hurdles that Wikipedia faces as it moves forward is the fact that as it increases um, its sort of army of online volunteers, um, it will have to conceive of how to sort of provide certain basic services to those volunteers, <coughs> help them manage uh, social uh, disputes that naturally occur between humans. Um, um, let's see, and I also think that um, harassment is a feminist issue because it has a huge effect on um, ge it, gender and diversity within Wikipedia, um, and a, a huge effect on special needs um, and contributions in non-English platforms where there's even less resources for learning about things like the gender gap or finding uh, uh, fellow voices that can you know, tell you how to mediate certain types of harassment. Um, so in terms in terms of continuing this sort of strain of thinking about um, volunteering as labor and harassment on Wikipedia, um, I also think it's important to consider that so some populations have a higher barrier to entry in online communities um, because of uh, digital literacy factors, but then when they actually are able to you know, perform the necessary tasks to engage, um, they're more often victims. Um, so these populations have uh, less time because of leisure inequality already and then have to spend more time uh, mediating their own these type the harassment that um, comes to them. So uh, I'm also interested in how mediating your own harassment um, <laughs> He, or medi mediating uh, your the mediating disputes that naturally occur on Wikipedia is a form of sort of effective labor. You know, I uh, generally talking to women in Wikipedia, there everyone has a story about a, a negative encounter. You know, in, I'm incredibly grateful for all the support I've had within Wikipedia. However, I think that this does come up more for women, and and it's important to talk uh, publicly about it. Um, but so women are for, forced to take on sort of this defensive role, explaining them, themselves. Um, sometimes also forced to take on anonymous identities or to hide their hide or protect their identity identity at higher rates to change their Wikipedia username. Um, there's also a fear uh, that I've uh, that I've observed in women that. Um, that feel that there's a risk in editing uh, so-called controversial topics about female sexuality, for instance, or seeing feminism itself as a controversial topic and straying away from those things. I've definitely encountered this in the wiki LGBT community, people that don't want to edit on LGBT topics, especially in other languages, because of this perceived <coughs> or, or known risk. Um, um, there's also something, uh, <clears throat> let's see. Um, I also like to ask the open question of if Wikipedia is actually made for men. Um, I, I, I think it's really interesting. I'm not a UX expert or anything like that, but it's interesting to consider the gendered aspects of design. I hope that comes maybe comes up a little more in the panel. Um, So just to back up a little bit, um, I'd kind of like to frame s some of these, the, the ways I've been talking about labor and, am, am I running out of time? Okay, uh, okay, okay, I'll try to wrap up. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about 1970s Italian feminism and the connection there is that um, movements like the wages for housework movement 
um, formally called for economic compensation for domestic work, um, attention to affective labors, and the reliance of capitalistic economies on exploitative labor practices, and specifically drawing attention to leisure inequality. And um, the wages for housework movement coming out of Italian feminism has sort of been re reapplied or reappropriated to talk about affective labors on Facebook. You might have heard of the Wages for Facebook project, which was actually a project of one of our art and feminism co-founders. Um, and I'd like to, to, to revive that, uh, at that specific uh, uh, critique and, and apply it to the uh, affective labors of Wikipedia and, and really try to talk more about the labor that goes into editing. Um, so I was, I was gonna go into that a little more, but just quickly to skip by um, that. I think we can also learn a lot from the uh, applying the sort of the theory and, and, and analysis coming from a, a new strain in uh, computer science, sociology, political science, sort of interdisciplinary studies on digital labor, uh, conceiving of the participants of the web as netizens, or in the words of Ursula Hughes, the cybertariats, um, thinking about how uh, online environments like Wikipedia collapse work and play. So it's, it is really both generating value uh, and also a social community. Um, uh, also, uh, environments like Wikipedia contributing to sort of a collapse of, of property and authorship online. You know, you don't necessarily claim your edits, and that's one of the, the ways that, I, that's one of, in some ways, the great aspects of Wikipedia, but there's also uh, so an interesting question of, you know, intellectual property and, and, and uh, knowledge work. Um, and also, uh, uh, the conversations um, about coming from scholars including Ian Bogost, Alexander Galloway, um, Tiziana Terranova, Beatrice Preciado on things like uh, protocol and the pro uh, different uh, rules of, in <coughs> online community or in the internet as a form of power and control uh, and things like um, thinking of uh, a knowledge work or a knowledge class um, so knowledge, Wikipedia editors as knowledge workers or knowledge laborers. Um, and um, so just, a, I, I wanted to kind of revive some of those strains of, that, that seem a bit disparate and just sort of uh, to recommend that you know, we consider Wikipedia in, with these terms. And we consider it through a, a critical lens as well as, um, you know, at the same and at the same time, embracing all of the great things about it, um, I, uh, including the way it's united, uh, you know, these global activist communities and um, made information more accessible. Um, so with that, I just um, uh, yeah. With that, I thank you so much for having me. to rush you know I, I do hope that we have some time at the end to talk about a lot of the really important issues that are being raised in our Q&A. Next presenter is Antoinette Lafarge and uh, Antoinette Lafarge is a professor of art in electronic art in the electronic art and design area at the University of California Irvine. She's associate director of the game culture and technology lab at UC Irvine as well as affiliated faculty at the UCI Center in Law Society and Culture. She is also the founding director of the Plain Text Players, an internet performance group that uses net-based virtual worlds to stage their performances. Uh, she has created work in the areas of mixed reality performance and installation, and has written that her beat is virtuality and its discontents. Please welcome <laughs> the internet.
Hi, everybody. I'm getting over cold. I'm a little hoarse, so forgive me if I sound really froggy. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a feminist scholar, although I am a feminist, and um, I come to uh, Wikipedia editing because I think the project is so important as a source of knowledge. And I'm always interested in getting uh, non-specialists involved in editing Wikipedia. I'm out there stomping the grounds trying to get a broad participation from people who are interested in contributing. So my own focus has been on doing short biographies of missing women, bringing them in because it's the first place my students go. I want them to be able to find these women. I don't care how complete they are. My major goal is to put out something up that is substantive and will stay up, two goals, and that can then be improved. So it doesn't have to, I'm, I basically want to talk about the pragmatics of Wikipedia. Um, it's possible to work in Wikipedia robustly without ever getting involved in major edit wars or being on the front lines of feminism coming out bloody every other day. It, you can, not everybody wants to do that and, and I deeply honor people who are doing the toughest pages on Wikipedia. That hasn't been my choice and I don't think it has to be everybody's choice. There's a lot of different ways we can make Wikipedia better. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit about how, how some of this looks from the ground level. Um, one of the things that I have seen in trying to bring people into Wikipedia is that Wikipedia itself has, it, it is itself a kind of barrier to entry in its interface, which is not easy for people to master who haven't done some HTML. And in particular, my big complaint is with its help system. I, to this day, after many years of editing, I cringe whenever I have to go into this massive walls of text that is the help system. I mean, I've worked as a professional editor for publishers and magazines, and I have never seen anything as daunting as, uh, give me the Chicago manual any day over Wikipedia <laughs> help pages. So um, in effect, well, I figured, I decided very early on that my strategy in Wikipedia was going to be what is the absolute least you need to know to get a page that you think is important up and to stay up. So in a way, I almost treat the whole thing like a serious intellectual game, right? And I, my workshops that I give are focused on, on telling people what's the absolute least you need to know so that you can then do the good work and not have your first. The worst thing is when your first page gets taken down, people never come back. When your first page gets trolled, they never come back, right? So the big issue is notability. These are paid, some of the pages I've done over the last couple of years. They're mostly short biographies. The big issue is this question of notability, and that's really germane in feminism because women are underreported, underwritten about, underdocumented, and so how do you establish notability? Um, I ha I'm here to say that it, it's not as hard as it sometimes looks. Um, if you spend time scraping whatever is out there on Google Books, and Google Scholar, and even and blogs, almost anything can count as a source. You have to have, in my experience, at least two substantive sources, which is you know basically peer-reviewed books, reasonably well-written books, magazine articles, good newspapers. It doesn't take a lot. And the more references, the better. Basically, you just want to show that you've done a lot of work and you're prepared to back your subject up. Um, and this is where we all owe a huge debt to first and second wave feminist writers because they have started to bring these women into their narratives. They may not say very much about them, but they're there and they're being referenced as an important part of history in books by sub substantial writers. So um, I want to just, just start by encouraging people not to feel like there's nothing out there. Even though, I've, you know, I've done Google searches where I search for some obscure person. A lot of these women, I, I've been specializing around the turn of the 20th century in the 1890, 1900 period a lot. Um, there's a huge, turns out there's often a huge amount of contemporary writing. A lot of these women were firsts of one kind or another. And newspaper, there are newspaper articles about them and they're often newspaper articles that reference their firstness. And so um, you may have to go back to, you know, 1900 newspaper to get your source, but it's there. And uh, some of the, since a lot of that stuff is being rapidly digitized, in, in some cases I have found it easier to put up pages for women who died 100 years ago than for women who died 20 years ago because um, of the way there's much more in the public domain and much more that's been digitized. People like Hedy Lamarr, 
who invented GPS and Wi-Fi, which is why you can do the search in the first place. Yeah, people like, I mean, yeah. but even earlier yeah. generations. That these are more pages we need to know about. Before. That's right. So, uh, that, so this, my first point was to talk about um, uh, um, notability. Uh, also, I wanted to um, mention, this is a, 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 the references for a page I did recently on a, um, actually on a historically black college that started out as a women's seminary. And I was referencing a Google Docs document, which I was informed wasn't really reputable enough, which, you know, okay, that's an argument you can have. So then I went back and scraped out all the original sources, and that was fine, just a little bit of extra referencing work. But I, I wanted, I left it in the references because this Pamela Foster, whoever she is, did a lot of work on this person, and sh so sh she needed to be kept in the references, even if somebody else didn't think she was a valuable source. So one of, the, one of my issues is also to make sure that the women who are writing this stuff are themselves kept in the references and turn up over and over in these pages. So that's another minor place where the feminist agenda operates is in who gets footnoted and who you're referencing, not just who you're writing about. Um, also, I want to talk about clusters. I have, just, I have found that when I, I tend to just stumble on things and then work on them for a while. So for a while, I was working on early 20th century architects. That's all those red boxes. And then I did another cluster on, of all things, colonial and immediately post-colonial Quaker women writers. Because I found a fabulous book about them and, and some really good sources. And it turns out that it's often easier to do them as a group because then their pages link to each other and you begin to have a narrative that's bigger than a single page. And of course, this is, this is other outside scholarship that is being brought in to bear in a way that makes it more accessible. But again, I'm not an expert in architecture, right? So I, I tread gingerly and I never do these pages without thinking that architects could do it and architectural scholars could do a much better job but I'm the one who's actually doing it, so I'm just gonna do the best job I can. But I educate myself in the process, and one of the things I notice when I do 12 pages on women architects from the first generation is that, um, you know, there, um, a lot of them were taking very consciously feminist stances to design. They were dealing with the pragmatics of house design from the woman's point of view. They wanted more pass-throughs from the kitchen, bigger closets, the stuff that male architects might have been doing but wasn't a major part of the rhetoric around uh, architecture. So by bringing into all these pages a discussion of what their architectural aesthetic was based on, the feminist sort of story of who's, what matters in architecture gets um, um, expanded. So just by doing these, these small pages, something larger <coughs> begins to be constructed that other people then make better. Um, and I find it, by the way, as this is an appeal to people in the world room who aren't Wikipedia editors yet, it's a great method of self-education for those of you who like miss being in college. You get to just read endlessly in something you're interested in and then write about it and it's published immediately and that is hugely rewarding because uh, I know I work on projects that take years to publish, and so I really appreciate having things that go up quickly. It makes me feel very good. <laughs> so that's my narcissistic uh, part of this <laughs> whole project. Um, um, and then, um, follow the footnotes is kind of also one of my m mantras. I was reading a book the, uh, not long ago, and I noticed that, actually it was in the preface, two, two out of a whole book of photographs, only two photographers were named. One was a fairly famous photographer who I'd heard of and knew she must already have a Wikipedia page as she did. And the other was this woman I had never heard of named Elzada Clover. So I immediately thought to myself, huh, this person's been called out by name in a book written 60 years ago. Maybe she was somebody. So I looked her up on Wikipedia. She didn't have a page. Turns out she was the first woman to go down the Grand Canyon. Um, and by raft, and she was the first person to catalog plant life on the Grand Canyon, so, and she, so she's a, a quite substantial botanist. The person who had a page was the guy who led her river rafting expedition. <laughs> and she was mentioned on his page, fairly enough, because she basically, her expedition put him on the map. Um, but that's the kind of thing that happens, is I, you, know, you chase down a footnote and discover somebody who needs a page. Um, that's the guy, Norm Neville, the rafter. Um. 
So that's all I wanted to really say um, about, about sort of just want to touch on a few uh, aspects of the pragmatics. Um, but I wanted to end, end by looking at something that has come to my attention in, in doing a lot of pages. Once you've done a page and if you're part of one of the projects, you, they get assessed for how important they are in a field and how well written they are, how substantial and complete they are. So um, I'm leaving the importance part aside, but I've been looking at how things get rated as stub, which is the simplest start, then um, C, B, A, and then you get things like to get higher, uh, to get to A or higher, you have to actually go through review processes. It's been kind of an editorial peer review process. And I've noticed, I did some, some quick looking around for today, and there's huge discrepancies with, within different fields and, and in a general way over how things are tagged at, at what level, but that which also, because it's available on the talk page, it can, it can influence how people think about a page. It's something that sounds, it's the word stub, the word start, make, the word C make things sound a lot less good than something that's B or C. Um, I don't know what to make of it. I think it would be great if somebody would do an actual data study on this, because all I have is anic data, which we know is not <laughs> all that great. But I did thought, thought I'd show, throw up four <laughs> quick comparisons, and, and then I'll, I'll, uh, we, can, we can actually have a Q&A. Um, this is James Westfall. This is um, a B page in astronomy. Um, so you can see there is some stuff here, a little bit of things, and you know seven footnotes. Here is a C page. This is a less lower qualification in the same field of astronomy. And as you can see, it's a much more substantial page. Oh. Yes, I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling <laughs> and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that was one of the bigger discrepancies I found. So, yeah, not, not very cool. Here's another one. This is um, Aldo Anderson in military history. This is a B quality. I picked military history to look at as one of the fields to look at because I figured that was there were probably a lot of men writing in that field, although there's by no means certain it's all men, obviously. So this is a B, and a number of the military ones looked, were Bs, were at about this level. So it's not that dissimilar to the B in astronomy that we looked at. Here's one from women's history, Agrippina the Elder, an extremely famous Roman um, woman. You can see it's a long and very substantial essay on her with ancestry and doesn't have as many notes. It's, that's one reason it will be downgraded. But this is considered a C class in women's history. So I just think that one of the things we could be looking at is how things get tagged. And as, when we look at the gestalt of a page, the all, so that all the little pieces are kind of taken into consideration. OK, thank you. And so um, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about how we think about intersectionality and how it reverberates maybe with feminist efforts more generally, historically, in feminist organi organizing and feminist pedagogies. You know, this isn't uh, a new debate for feminism. And so it's something that maybe Wikipedia is having to think about in a different way of how to um, understand its environment, trying to solve this problem of gen the gender gap, the woman problem, and then actually thinking about what kind of environment or what kinds of protocols, procedures, history are we welcoming people into, feminists having the same kind of question of like what we don't want to just have representation of other types of feminists or black feminists or trans feminists, but we actually want to think about that in the actual uh, design of our organizing efforts. And so if we have any thoughts with the panel about that kind of hard question. I always like starting really difficult and then we'll just like yeah. go into the like easier stuff. But it, I don't know if you have any thoughts. I tried to diffuse with a joke there. <laughs> in all transparency. I guess one thing, um, I, I don't necessarily side by the critiques of technology scholar Jaron Lanier about Wikipedia. You may know him, but one, one of the things he said, he talks about Wikipedia's monologic language. So he talks about how it's, you know, it's history is usually written from, you know, like many different ways of speaking, you know, it, I, I was a history major, and we mostly studied primary source texts, 
not secondary text. And what you get out of the primary source is a voice. And it might not be a you know, Western literary academic voice. It might be a person that you know, could write their tone. But Wikipedia you know, requires this certain way of speaking that establishes, uh, I mean, this. I don't necessarily agree with Lanier's other criticisms of Wikipedia, but thinking about this monologic language aspect. And, and I won't say that all articles are written in the same tone. However, I think that it, there is something to sort of this like Western academic tone and that makes it hard for uh, people that haven't necessarily studied history to contribute if that makes sense. Um. And you maybe more than any of the other panelists, I, I'd be curious about your, you know, your history and how you came to thinking about Wikipedia critically <coughs> from where you may have started or it seems, you know, it's well, academic publishing is so slow. <coughs> it's really gratifying when Wikipedia publishing is so, I'm, I'm overlapping. Oh. I'm threading together things. I'm bringing things together. <laughs> so I, I was just setting that up to say that Dorothy, it seems to me that you may have uh, written in a Wikipedia style before coming to an academic way of speaking. And so I wonder how that affects how you now are able to write critically or if you find that to be a different kind of style or tone. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to also second, as a, as a kind of follow-up question, uh, thinking about the different speeds or different kinds of tones of writing for academic publishing as different from fandom, as different from Wikipedia writing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, um, I came from a history background, so Wikipedia was like the perfect like food for my like fetish for bibliographies <laughs> and like writing bibliographies. Um, and and I do think that people train in like library science and you know uh, and archival science are especially good at editing because they've been trained in this style and. That's one of the reasons we've, you know, reached out to them in particular, and that they've been such great collaborators. Um, but yeah, it is an interesting question. I mean, we have there are classes teaching high schoolers how to edit, and there's this sort of lingering question of how early is it okay for someone to edit Wikipedia? Mm -hmm. Like, is it okay if a five-year-old is editing? Mm -hmm. And I mean, <laughs> it's <laughs> that I've heard, you know, debates about that, and it's it is interesting. Like, who who actually has access? To, to writing history and when history is written in from a secondary voice rather than a primary voice where you have a little bit more freedom for creativity in your tone, that does, that relationship does change. Um. I just want to say also that I'm wary of us thinking Wikipedia has to be everything to everyone at all times. Also, I myself am a little bit more than sick of all the opinion journalism that constitutes what seems like 90% of the visible web these days. Everybody has an opinion about everything, often very well expressed, and that's great, but it, it's almost as if that doesn't need a place in Wikipedia. There's a certain refreshing <laughs> lack of um, um, a color to Wikipedia sometimes. What do you mean by that? What does that mean? Well, it can't be neutral, right? We understand that, but the, there's one one spends a lot of time struggling to try to form opinions that are not rah rah or complete cut downs, right? So that it doesn't one leaves a certain latitude for the person reading it to form an opinion about it, whereas. Most opinion journalism on the web has a very, very big axe. It's raised got at one point, and it's going to take 600 words to, to persuade you of its point of view, and often does a very good job of that too. Um, but the but the the axe, so to speak, is always highly visible. Now you could just say that Wikipedia tries to disguise the axe, but uh, I think at its best, it it tries to. Mm, mm, tries to open a ground where one could think about something without being necessarily completely persuaded in any direction. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, I actually have a question um, for 
for you. Um, so you mentioned like uh, firstness as one quality of, uh, was it 19th century women that, or like they were able to especially sort of write about. Yeah. Um, I'm curious like what your thoughts are about using firstness as a qualifier for notability um, for women, because it, it is actually something that has been sort of debated within the Wikipedia community, and it's an interesting question of does being the first, you know, it's it's one way that history is often written for women especially, it's mm -hmm. that was the first woman to do that, first woman to do that, but there is sort of like something at stake in using that. Right. Well, yes, I understand that. Um, but if you think about it, an enormous number of the men in there are in there because they were the first at something also, and then uh, that that's usually there. There's usually a lot more there as well because uh, they often had much more widespread impact because of the way male inventions, male activities get picked up and amplified throughout the culture. But there, nobody says that the X shouldn't be in there because they were the first inventor of something. They're all in there just as well. And so uh, when women come into a field and begin to, to show how they would do something differently, um, how they would make it better, how they would make it different, I don't really have a problem with that. Um, this is the comment from the audience. <laughs> do you want to hold on one second so the oh, live stream okay. audience can hear you as well? First of all, thank you very much. I enjoyed <clears throat> all everyone's individual ex um, perspective. It was really enlightening. Um, just uh, a comment about the astronomy. So I'm a female astronomer, so I was very delighted to see the, uh, the exposure. <clears throat> and one of the references that I saw was the Marie Curie Complex, which is a great book <clears throat> because it highlights female scientists. You know, as a female scientist, you're always told about Marie Curie because she was, you know, the first of everything. But as a double Nobel laureate, that's a quite a large bar to set <laughs> and to, you know as a male scientist there are lots of other kind of average male scientists yeah. to see and one of the things that I think this pro all of your efforts are so important is because they also add a lot of not firsts you know a lot of more ad average is the wrong word but just general add more you know exposure uh, to women in the field because then you suddenly realize oh there were many fem more female scientists that I can aspire to without having to look at Mari Curie as my role model. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, keep doing what you're doing. I think it's very important. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm interested in, um, I've been working with Marcia and I'm, I'm in more in the urban game and we got to get that on the list there, uh, for the cities game is how Wikipedia is being used as a model for other kinds of platforms, especially community-based open platform, knowledge platforms, whether you're cooperative knowledge and, and sharing things to the giant juggernaut of the smart city, talk about male-dominated kind of thing that is going on. And it is a really scary kind of thing where the UN might just essentially adopt Cisco as a methodology for judging everything, and it's, it's not science fiction. But your question, that discussion of how do I write, and how do I write the knowledge, I think your observation is very important, because if we're going to create open knowledge platforms that are created by local communities, how do we write it in such a way that I can get the information, but then take it out and make it political in a kind of conversation, and understand that this isn't the political conversation, but it's a knowledge to have a baseline to go somewhere because you have to establish some sort of baseline. And I've been talking to Marcia because there's so many people looking at Wikipedia because it, in some regards it's the only global scale um, community collective. And I don't think anybody's, I like to say it to her, but only 49% of the people are involved in, in making it. So, uh, so there's, there's, I think there's a bigger question here as we look at models, and it's the only one I've seen that actually has a kind of what I call meso-level discourse, mm -hmm. and it is in sort of macro, micro, and I think that's why there's the struggle, that there is a very large community in it, and, I f and it's rare to find, mm -hmm. it's really, really rare. So I, I would like to, I love your doc, I absolutely, you're absolutely right, and I think the doc brings that, that, that question forward, so thank you. 
response from the panel. Is there any other questions that people are wanting to ask? Um, yeah, I think that that's an interesting question about the local community and thinking about how it's been, how you, how you determine the local in this global community that writes this encyclopedia and what kinds of connections you make and what kinds of models you're drawing on when you're talking about Wikipedia work and feminism and other kinds of things in relation to other kinds of structures and systems. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that, so we can talk about editing Wikipedia as feminists, but not editing Wikipedia with a feminist slant. Like there's, there, the reason, if there's um, sort of a pretty strongly regulated sort of policy related to this where you, you can't be a social justice warrior on Wikipedia and, and, and that's come up recently with the Gamergate article where we had some feminist or uh, sort of actively feminist writing sort of the feminist take on the Gamergate story that were banned from editing certain types of articles because of the, this stance. And it's an interesting question because I, I want activists to be able to edit Wikipedia. Um, I think it's important um, just in the sense of, I, I worked with uh, Free Cooper Union students to write the Free Cooper Union financial crisis um, and activism like Wikipedia article. And that was a, a test in, you know, uh, sort of translating their strong bias into Wikipedia language, and I think there is a way to do that, but it's not necessarily done through edit, like actively using that that um, that opinionated tone. Um, so that's an interesting sort of like nexus. Um, I was thinking about um, how. I don't really care if Wikipedia is the best. I wanted to, I think of it as a starting place and that the crucial thing is that the stuff there be enough that, to get you going and sending you off. And I, it wasn't, I feel extremely slow in the fact that it was only after I started editing Wikipedia that I realized I was really pissed off at the New Yorker because they never footnote anything. They're, they're, yeah. they're, yeah. You can get really right. interested in something but you don't know where to go next. Yeah. They don't tell yeah. you where they got their information. Yeah. It's like this little clutch up. We fact checked it for you. Take it for granted. Yeah. I say the hell with that. <laughs> Knowing its proper role is I really liked your distinction about the macro, micro, the meso level because I think that's um, that in that level is 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 the a good description of the kind of level of the intervention or the innovation that we were trying to make both with the doc and with the wiki, um, the wiki Wikipedia editing, and it exists also in the confines of Wikipedia. One of the things that I really enjoy, and I have this fantasy about um, how I'm going to spend my retirement years, <laughs> which is rip editing Wikipedia pages, <laughs> it, because I have a sticky note of topics, so I haven't quite been able to make the writing time to do it, but I have a sticky note of topics and names that I want to write on. And I realized that if, as we um, got more um, kind of uh, acculturated to Wikipedia, there's the Wikipedia Feminist Project, and then in the sub-pages, there are sub-projects. So there's a, a Women in Game project and so on, and they're just, it, it appeals to me, the, um, not so much the bibliography, but the list making, where there's just a list of edits to be made, which is a kind of, again, a meso level between doing the stub or doing the kind of more global criticism one way to contribute is just make a list for someone else and to leave breadcrumbs for someone else. And that too is a really important, you know, important enough. And I, I know that that's a good kind of mode of intervention or a kind of intersection for, um, for <laughs> fan, fan communities. That a lot of what I see happening on Wikipedia, it's not um, only kind of the individuals that get you know, they get in involved, but people get involved because they're, they're members of fan communities. 
not so much because they recognize the others in the community, but they're a fan of a piece of military history or a fan. I mean, why else are all the television shows just so perfectly detailed? Yeah. Right? It's because, you know, so I think in part what we were trying to do, and I've said this before about feminism, is really fan the fandom of fem feminism so that people would, would go there and want to, you know, want to make those pages be better I'm just going to say one, one more thing about uh, Bill's question and something that we've been talking a lot about is also the in, in-person meetings uh -huh. that come from uh, Wikipedia, like the want to connect <laughs> actually in person is really important and I think helps serve the link within that meso level and that's even more important in sustaining all different types of engagement, whether it's just that one day edit a thon, or if it's a continuous like once a month meetup, or if it's meeting up on a certain topic, um, I think that those are really, really important for not only building community, but addressing that really important middle layer. So one of the things that Dorothy just brought up was uh, the actions of Wikipedia's arbitration committee in response to the Gamergate article and the banning of several feminist editors and on the flip side, not banning several uh, noted uh, sock puppet, meat puppet yeah. accounts designed to add pro-Gamergate or report the controversy uh, style facts to pages of the overall subject as well as a large number of the victims. Uh, this, this points quite a bit to the uh, invisible politics of infrastructure which portrays itself so True. consistently to be neutral, yeah. um, which really ties deeply into your research. Uh, I'm wondering <laughs> if you could elaborate a little bit more about the uh, higher level politics of where Wikipedia is going now that it has been noted uh, that there are significant biases which contradict its mission. Where is it going? Where is it digging in? And where is their progress? Where are their green shoots? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know that just recently there's been some grant funding opportunities that's been published um, on Wikipedia to try and address this issue. Um, I think that it's actually really new and that there are um, widespread initiatives to engage in really meaningful ways. And I think that the evidence of the earned feminism um, Edit-a-thon that just happened a couple of weeks ago is a testament to that being a very new question that I think people are trying to tackle um, because the, in, the hidden infrastructures that I mentioned are so subtle and sometimes you can't pinpoint where exactly all these things are coming from. And then you have questions of like, how do I tackle the leisure inequality? How do I provide um, childcare? How do I even get people who don't have the time even on a weekend to come to this? I mean, when you really start diving into what those hidden infrastructures do look like, you can't even answer that half of the time. And it becomes really, really difficult to design and sustain, like to design for that sustaining engagement to try and shift that culture and to address all of those really political issues. So I think that your question is actually an incredibly good one that I'm still trying to ask myself and I think Wikipedia is asking itself and I think a lot of editors who are very invested in making it a really good encyclopedia are constantly asking themselves. So I don't know. Yeah, just, or I, I you just wanted to yeah. just say one thing on the Gamergate controversy. I spent pro more than eight hours trying to read to the bottom of what was going on with that. And I'm not actually convinced. I mean, they did ban a number of people and sock puppet accounts, so they did. But it was really difficult to get to the bottom of whether or not the editors they banned were feminist or not, or whether or not they were just being good editors and trying to um, and, try, and trying to moderate edit wars, mm -hmm. and who was being accused of edit wars, and the, I mean, it was it was so much more complicated than what the news reports reported mm -hmm. on. You know, going all the way back to having to figure out when different accounts were created, 
and then go back to the 4chan discussions about creating those accounts. I mean, it led all over the place in a way that the headlines that came out, Wikipedia bans feminist editors. I wanted to believe because I wanted I want to make some, you know, you know, some polemic. But when I actually went in to try to get to the bottom of it, like how did they know they were feminists? When they're, you know, only one of the editors was ever referred to as a with a gendered pronoun in any of the work that they had done. So they didn't even know if they were women or men or so. So that it, in fact it really revealed to me. The, the complexity of the procedures that go into pro producing, arbitrating Wikipedia's discourse production. And that mere mortals have a, a really kind of daunting project to try to get at the bottom of something when it becomes controversial. Yeah, just to add to that, um, one thing that I would really like to see happen is like Wikipedia's um, higher courts have like so the equivalent of like court reporters or people that their job would be to like translate and mm -hmm. summarize some of these findings for a public non-Wikipedia audience because I definitely have seen a lot of reporting about the Wikipedia that is kind of off base um, but as far as you know what we're doing to um, change some of the dynamics of these like invisible politics. Um, I think that that I you know I'm really uh, excited about all of the the, the art and feminism campaign and the work of recruiting female editors. But I think we need to get better at not just focusing on content contributions to articles in that like historical way and actually get women to run for like admin positions mm -hmm. um, because those are definitely really highly like even a higher percentage of men, male to female there. Um, and, but there's, it's interesting that women, and maybe this is, I don't know, maybe there's a reason for this that women often focus really on adding content to Wikipedia in the form of you know, writing in history and not necessarily on all of the other sorts of maintenance tasks or um, you know, add, like from adding categories, tagging articles, or doing just some of the more behind the scenes stuff, um, like reviewing new articles um, or participating in the deletion discussions or pr in the poli discussions about the actual policies themselves, which are very dynamic. So trying to you know, get women in those places of, of higher power within Wikipedia as well. Um, but also, yeah, it's interesting that you know, even the, the people in positions of power within Wikipedia, they do get it in, you know, you do get be, to being an admin through an election process and, and applying. However, um, it, I think it's important to question, like, what are the checks and balances of that power, you know? Uh, and and it's, it is often very hard to discover that stuff, mm -hmm. as you tell. So, so translating those, those policies and procedures in, into more readily readable language. And I think that goes back to the question I was trying to ask in the beginning, which is that uh, you can't just build a ballpark and then they're going to come, right? You have to also <laughs> allow people to build the bases or you know, be the umpire. Um, and so those kinds of assumptions that we have about what will happen with Wikipedia if we just add women and stir, it's going to be disappointing if you do that, right? right? That's not going to be the right kind of campaign because the structures may go unchallenged and uh, those, that's exactly the work that you're, trying, that you're doing with the thesis. Um, so I wonder if there are any other comments or questions from the audience. Um, or we should just yeah, <laughs> warm up because it's so important to drink some red wine. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.